You got it. And I think we're gonna take a few questions. Yes, so I'm happy to answer any questions that you all may have. I love Q&A, I would actually rather do Q&A than give speeches. Talk to us about your strategy of getting the message out to the world. What, how do you do it and what's the ground game? So the question is, what's our strategy and ideas for getting out the rural vote and what messages are we using? So the good thing about the Democratic Party is that our values and the issues we care about actually are very well received in rural communities if we're talking about them. So things that I may talk about in Omaha or Lincoln, our two cities, may not be exactly what I'm leading with in rural America. So in our rural towns, we talk a lot about property rights and making sure that corporations aren't taking people's land uh, over eminent domain. Uh, and on the flip side, for our tribes, that's protecting their sovereign rights to make sure that they have the right to determine uh, their land's future. Um, we talk a lot about right to repair. It's a very important thing for farmers and ranchers that they are able to fix their own farm equipment and not have to travel, you know, two hours to the John Deere dealership uh, in, you know, six towns over. But that also relates to city folks, because if you've ever broken your phone and go to the mall to get it fixed, you break your warranty. So same thing for farmers and ranchers. If they try to fix a much bigger piece of equipment, more expensive, uh, it breaks their warranty too. Um, people assume that folks in rural communities do not want women to have their reproductive freedom. And that is false. Uh, Bold and the party in Nebraska have done polling after polling after polling every single year. A lot of rural folks will describe themselves as pro-life. That's part of their identity. And for us to try to change that identity is trying to tell somebody they're not a Chiefs fan, they're not a Catholic, you know, it's, it is in their DNA that they are pro-life. They're very proud of that. But when you then ask them the second question, do you think that women should have reproductive rights? The majority actually will say yes. 60% say that they're pro-life, 60% believe that women should have reproductive rights in the state of Nebraska. I bet you if a poll was done in Oklahoma, it'd be similar. Um, so we can't be scared to talk about uncomfortable issues in our rural towns, because as soon as we do, the rural people will smell fear on you. They won't trust you. And they will think that you're just like all the other big city Democrats, you know, that live in New York. So my advice to all of our candidates all the time is one, obviously know what's happening in rural towns. There's always an issue of something happening in a rural community. And two, be yourself. If you don't wear cowboy boots, don't wear cowboy boots when you go to a rural town. If you don't hunt, don't put on a camo vest or a TV ad. Um, you know, it's like I tell candidates when they go to talk to young Dems, you do not have to wear a t-shirt and jeans when you go to talk to the young Democrats. You can just wear your regular clothing. Um, so it's really about being your authentic self. Do you add Monsanto and the right to prepare? Ah, yes. Farmers do not like Monsanto. Uh, they don't like contract farming of places like Costco, Costco and others. You know, they know that for some younger farmers that that might be an entry point into farming and ranching, but that it only puts them in a cycle of debt, so it doesn't really solve the problem. Um, so yeah, Monsanto's a big deal. They also may not, they don't use the words climate change. Um, you know, it took... 12 years for us in Nebraska to stop the Keystone XL pipeline. And that took a very unlikely alliance of farmers, ranchers, progressive tribal nations all coming together. Um, they, and I didn't even use the words climate change because I wasn't a climate activist when we started that fight. But it was interesting because we were honest with each other and teaching each other, they taught me things about the land and the Ogallala Aquifer that I didn't know. I taught them about organizing and politics. It was a really beautiful relationship, which is what we should, and I talk about this in Harvest the Vote, you have to almost model what we did around Keystone XL. That's one example. You could insert any organizing campaign on an issue and apply that to politics so it's not so transactional all the time. Um, but it was interesting for me, the farmers and ranchers who were engaged in that fight, about year three, they started to use the word climate change. 
Um, and not all, but some have changed their party registration, not to be a Democrat. They're like, don't push us that far, Jane. Uh, but they're independents, uh, and they have stopped watching Fox because they think that Fox has really done a lot of damage to their community. So relationships, it's a long, it's a long haul. But really good people live in our rural towns. Yeah, what's your, what is your sage advice for Arkansas River Rights? Ah, the river rights. Well, my sage advice is to start having a lot more accountability to the industry and the utility that's right there on the bank of the river um, and having them have a lot more transparency in the testing on a more regular basis. Uh, not pretending that these concrete booms essentially are going to contain the uh, pollution that continues to flow into the river. And that pollution just doesn't, it's not just on the surface, it's actually in the sediment now in the bed of the river. I, if I had a kid, I'm not sure I would have my child be swimming in that river. Um, so I think it's, it's a lot about responsibility of, the, of citizens to put pressure on industry. And we can do this with things called community benefit agreements, where we can acknowledge that we have to have industry and utilities to exist. I'm not saying that we don't. Uh, and I'm not even a climate activist that says we have to be 100% clean energy. But, you know, 20% clean energy is sad for America, right? So it should be more like 40 or 50%. So we could do a community benefit agreement. It's something, Barbara, that you and I should talk about, where you put things in writing that the industry is going to provide the community in order to keep them more accountable. Hi, we actually struggle with a lot. I'm in Okmulgee County, it's the next county south, with homelessness in <clears throat> rural populations. We're trying to come up with ways to help bring affordable housing and jobs to sort of help alleviate homelessness. What Do you have anything that you guys are doing in Nebraska? Yes, so such a good question. So we, our, the town that I live in is about 25,000. And up until about five years ago, we didn't have any apartments. Like we only had houses, right? Because in small towns, you're not building big apartments. And it finally got through to the mayor and the city council that we need apartments. We not only need more affordable homes that people can raise their kids in, but we need apartments. Um, so there are now four apartment complexes and a new one coming up, which has significantly helped young people, nurses, teachers, um, people who are just getting a start. So I think you know, President Biden has obviously invested a ton of money. And so if your community isn't aware of the grants and money accessible, uh, going to the Department of Housing on, you know, at the federal level is super critical. There's so much resources right now for cities, counties, especially in rural towns or in communities uh, where uh, African Americans, Latinos live that can get access to those funding. I just wanted to ask if you have found any success in engaging uh, younger folks in any of the capacities you have had as an activist or as a party official across many different things. Yes. The question was, have I had any success and in, in what have we done to engage young people? So, you know, I used to be the president of the Young Democrats of America. Um, <laughs> a couple years ago, they gave me my pin. I don't have it on today, uh, where I'm a lifetime young Dem. So I'm very proud of that at 51. Um, so a couple things. One, when I was the head of the Young Dems, we were stuck in a status quo style of politics where we went to a lot of party events and you know had our campus chapters, but we weren't doing the hardcore organizing on the ground. And so that's for me, message number one is for the young Dems, college Dems, high school Dems to start doing your own door-to-door -door campaigns where you're not talking to all voters, where you're talking to young voters. Uh, what we learned in experiments that we ran because we raised a bunch of money to do this was typically other voters need about three contacts in order to get them to the polls. Young people need six. They need three traditional, so a phone call, a door knock, a text, a piece of mail. And then they need three peer-to-peer -peer contacts in places where they're super comfortable, right? Skate parks, concerts, coffee shops, more you know, casual events. 
So that would be one thing, is to run more peer-to-peer -peer campaigns uh, yourselves, talking to other young people. Um, we just, it took literally six years for me to raise this. Uh, we just got $100,000 to revamp Young Dems in Nebraska. So we're working with the Young Dems, the college Dems, and the high school Dems to rebuild our chapters. Cherry Andrews know this. You all know this if you're on a college campus. COVID decimated youth organizing. Uh, because normally young people come into the party as a freshman and they kind of get involved in the college Dems, but then they start getting involved in campaigns and then they start getting involved in the state or county party. And then sometimes they actually become uh, party officials or they become candidates. It's like this ladder of engagement that young people do. And COVID just knocked that out. And it knocked it out for not just one or two years, which is what most people think. It knocked it out for four to six and so we are in serious rebuilding mode. And so my other advice is don't be worried that you don't have 50 people showing up at your Young Dems meeting right now. It is going to take time to rebuild. Don't beat yourself up about it. Um, you are in the same boat as all of us of rebuilding that and convincing young people that our party cares about them um, because right now, a lot of young people are either registering as independents or gravitating towards more issue-based groups. So go to those issue-based groups meetings and stand up and say, I'm with the Young Dems. If you're not registered to vote, I have voter registration forms. If you want to vote by mail, even though I know that's harder in Oklahoma than it is in Nebraska. It's not hard. You can, you can do vote by mail here. Oh, maybe it was. No, it's, okay, I'm sorry. Maybe it was Texas. That you have to have, the, you have, to have your vote by mail form notarized. You have to have that here too? Oh no, that's not right. Um, that's, that's voter suppression. Jane. Um, so I would assume that guns are really mm. important to the people that live in rural areas. Yes. How do you, how do you reassure people that you're not trying to take their guns for them, from, away from them? Although I admit that's what I'd like to do. <laughs> but, you just you just want them maybe to read the Second Amendment. No, that's that's too snarky. Never mind. That you, that you want to that you want to have a reasonable policy about how I don't know. I don't even know what I'm trying to say. Yeah, no. The question about guns. What do we say and do about guns? Um, I do have a chapter about this in Harvest the Vote because it is sometimes complicated on the one hand, but simple on the other. So. First, we did do a piece for our state and county fairs, which ruffled some feathers of our beloved Dems in the cities, but the rural people love it. So we still have the piece. And if anybody wants me to send it to them, I will. Uh, on the front, it says, keep your guns, keep your meat, keep your land. Because in our small towns, they were getting the message that not only do we want their guns, but that we're creating all this new lab meat to put them out of business. And so, especially ranchers in Nebraska are very angry about that. Um, and then the land piece is obviously very important for folks in agricultural communities because they wanna be able to control the land that they're producing on and passing down to future generations. Um, so one, just acknowledging that no, what you're hearing on Fox and other places is not true and put that in writing, sometimes using humor is very important when you're doing politics. We can't always be in our suits and ties very serious with a 16 page platform. Um, so one, acknowledging the facts. And two, I think we do have to acknowledge and be uncomfortable with rural communities and rural households do have more guns than folks in the city. Um, they're often in safes and that's something that we talk about is making sure that our guns are in safe storage. Um, a lot of rural people though too, and we see this in polling, they believe that there should be reforms, right? That they don't believe that a universal background check infringes on their first or their second amendment right. Right now, the background check system is such a patchwork quilt. You could go across the state line and be able to buy a gun if you couldn't buy it in another state. Um, so talking about basic gun laws is also something that I think we have to talk about and constantly reiterate that, no, we're not talking. I know some people in the room may want to banish guns forever. I get that. Um, but that's not a reality in America. Um, but we also shouldn't have more guns than people in America, which is also a problem.
Yes. What do we do to get our message out? I listen to NPR. I never turn on Fox. But it seems to me that our media is so absorbed with the other party that we don't hear anything about what the Democrats have done, what they will do. Yes. How do we get a voice back in their media? Yes. So the question is, how do we get a voice back in the media? Uh, because so often, even progressive media is so focused on the radical right and isn't talking about all the good things that President Biden and Kamala, Vice President Harris have done. I think there's two things. One, obviously tackling the national media is difficult for anybody in this room, but that doesn't mean that we can't still write letters to the editor and op-eds. Like that's the easy answer that probably everybody tells you. Something that we did this past fall, which we'll do again next year because it was super popular and I'll send you a copy. We created our own newspaper. It was really cheap to do. Little did I know that creating a little newspaper was gonna be so cheap. Uh, so, we called it Dems Deliver. And on the front was a map of the state of Nebraska and all of the investment that Biden and Harris have done in our state, literally billions of dollars. Every small town, every big city, it was a map. And it detailed out the projects. Then if you clicked on the, if you went to our website, you got to read more about those projects. Inside, there were articles written in Spanish, articles written by Native American and uh, African American leaders. We listed candidates that had announced so far a party's platform. We did concrete actions that people could take. We called it a passport. So if you, because that's really popular in our state, it's like this tourism thing. So we adopted that. So if you registered a voter, you know, put up a yard sign, there's like 20 things you could do. If you did five and sent it in, we sent you a sticker. If you did 10, we sent you a t-shirt. So we did fun things like that. People love this newsletter, this newspaper. They absolutely love it. We put it out at county fairs, at the state fair. It was something that people could take that was more than just a flyer that went more in depth about our party. So we were, my message with that is that we were telling our story on our terms with our messages. And I think that that's important because NPR and MSNBC are not going to save us. And I hope one day the Trump fever breaks for mass media, but I'm nervous that it won't because, you know, if you look at TV, you don't see them talking about all the times that Trump is just going on and on and on rambling, you know, misnaming people. I mean, just all these crazy things that he's doing from the podium. And if Biden literally says one word wrong, then, oh my God, you know, He's done for, he, you know, should retire, et cetera, et cetera. So it is a very unbalanced media right now. But because none of us in this room can fix that, I think we have to do what we can do at the local and state level, which is create pieces that has our own message and narrative. Yeah. yeah. All right, Dems, run for office. Keep building the party at the local level. That's where the action is. Thanks, everybody. Oh. <laughs> Don't go away.